Okay, so now that um, I have to talk about high content flow cytometry dissect memory T cell responses, um, uh, it's uh, it's it's great to talk about this topic because thanks to new technologies nowadays we can really measure things that we were not able to measure in the past, and I think this led to discovery new uh, facets of T cell differentiation that we didn't know before. So the major topic uh, in the lab is, is the study of memory CD80 cell differentiation, how these cells develop into, uh, yeah, so, so how the, the, the immune response develops into potent memory cells. So we know that there is a few naive precursors in the, in the human body specific for a given epitope. Uh, even though these cells are rare, they're capable to scan uh, uh, lymph nodes in the circulation for a specific for the specific cognate antigen. So once you have an infection, once you have a, a, a challenge with uh, the antigen, then these cells get activated. They give rise to a huge amount of effector cells, which are important to fight the infection uh, in the peripheral tissues. Um, and once the infection is gone, these effector cells are not needed anymore and they must be eliminated. So they die. 90, 95% of these cells die and they leave behind a population of memory cells, which is capable to persist in the long term. And uh, the good thing of the memory response is that uh, these cells are sensitized to the antigen. So upon the secondary encounter, they're capable to give rise to a more rapid and more potent uh, response. So that's why, for example, we get vaccinated because we, we need to, to be ready uh, for the true encounter with, uh, with the infection. So over the years, uh, we and and uh, also together with the work uh, the, the work of other people, we have uh, described a lot of uh, many different subsets. This is just a summary, but there's a lot more. Um, uh, and we like to order uh, the differentiation in a sort of linear way, uh, where we have uh, uh, less differentiated progenies, such as the uh, central memory cells described by Federica Salusta more than 20 years ago. And this was our contribution to the field on the identification of stem cell memory cells. Once these cells are activated, they can give rise to more differentiated memory progenies. Um, we can use a different combination of markers, uh, uh, for example, on a, on a cell sorter to identify all these different different subsets. Um, and the interesting thing about this is not just the game uh, that, that we want to play with all these different subsets, but, but the interesting thing is once we can sort them out, we can characterize their function. And once we identify a function, then we can promote it or ablate it, uh, depending on what we need. So, for example, we know that uh, as the, the cells differentiate more, they tend to lose proliferative potential. They tend to lose stemness, also metabolism changes. Uh, the cytotoxic activity tends to increase. Uh, it, it is important to mention, though, that this is immediacy of cytotoxic activity. It doesn't mean necessarily that these are the best cells for immunotherapy, for example. Instead, we prefer to use less differentiated population because they might not be uh, cytotoxic uh, right away after stimulation, but they, they, they can maintain cytotoxic potential in the long term. And that's a very good thing when you have like persistent uh, um, uh, injuries such as uh, a tumor. So you need a long-term response that might be able to fight uh, the cancer. So um, the, as I mentioned, this was our contribution to the field. This is the original study we published with Luca Gattinone when I was working at the NIH. In that case, we compared different subsets of memory cells. Uh, this was uh, the identification of the memory stem cell population. In this case, uh, this was an experiment done together with Carl June, where we modified uh, the memory stem cells uh, with a chimeric antigen receptor. And once injected into, the into, into a preclinical model, these memory stem cells were much more potent than central memory or effective memory cells in controlling uh, uh, the, the tumor. And here it's just uh, seen by uh, the survival of, of, of the mice in the long term. And since then, a number of different studies including ours, um, have shown that if you have these stem-like signature in the product uh, of, of infusion, uh, for example, of, of CAR T-cell therapy, you have a much higher chance of undergoing uh, complete remission or in experimental systems uh, to uh, reject the, uh, the tumor. So once I started the lab, I basically asked uh, um, uh, an important question. Uh, we moved to solid tumors. And the question was, if we could identify stem-like memory cells in tumors, and you know, if these cells had a role in the response, uh, and if those cells were present, uh, were they 
somehow responding to a hierarchy of the immune response among the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, similar to that uh, to that that we found uh, in uh, in the circulation or in the uh, non lymphoid in in the lymphoid tissues in healthy individuals. So um, we applied uh, classical flow cytometry by using a number of markers that we described before, uh, and we searched for these stem-like CD8s in the in the tills. Uh, this is a representative patient with no small cell lung cancer, but you can see here that there is basically a very small population of, of cells responding to this phenotype. So double positive for CCO7 and RA, and then uh, expressing also CD95. Uh, so you can really count the cells. So there were like three cells in, in, in this individual. So we were a bit disappointed, um, but nevertheless, we... Um, we didn't give up, so we applied a new technology. This, this, uh, we were uh, fortunate enough uh, from in our institute to install one of the first machines um, of, of this kind in the world. Um, it's a uh, it's BD Symphony A5. Uh, just to, just to say, I don't have any conflict of interest. Um, so the, the, we we had the possibility to include a new laser, a 355 nanometer laser, uh, UV capable to excite these new dyes, and uh, also there were new um, new dyes uh, uh, from uh, from the company excited by by the classical lasers, for example, these ones are 488, or additional BV dyes, brilliant violet dyes, excited by by the violet laser. So this made a uh, the machine a 28 color machine. Um, Ideally, the machine is already capable to host new lasers. Uh, we already have some floor pumps, but apparently there is a technical problem with the development of DPUV and near infrared lasers. But ideally, the machine could become a 50 parameter flow cyclone. So I'm not going into the technicalities of uh, panel development because I did this in, in my past talk uh, uh, during uh, the series. Um, but I just want to highlight uh, that all the um, steps that I require to develop, apply, and analyze uh, complex panels are found in this protocol that we published together with the lab of, lab of Burger Becker in Zurich uh, two years ago in Nature Protocols. So uh, the paper, I guess it's open access, so you can, you can download it. Otherwise, email me and uh, you know, I, I can share the, the, the previous draft. So um, just to talk about the application, the major application that, that, that we did originally. So we had the possibility to collaborate with the thoracic surgery in our hospital. We identified, we isolated 53 different tumors, uh, non-small cell lung cancer in this case. We had the possibility also to collect the normal adjacent lung tissue. This is very important because it gives you an idea of the landscape of T cells according uh, to the inflammatory state of the patient. So if the guy is a smoker or a non-smoker, then it can be different. And we were also able to collect uh, for some patients the blood. Uh, we uh, dissected the tissues to single cell suspension, and then we run our uh, complex uh, flow cytometry pan. So um, at that time, we, we started a new approach of data analysis. So we thought that it was not necessary to analyze the data in a, a classical way anymore. So uh, not doing the, the, all the manual gates that were required to identify populations. So, for example, double positive for, for, for some markers and then negative or positive. So by using binary gates. Um, but we isolated the population of interest. In that case, was CD8 cells. And we got CD8 cells from all the individuals and all the samples that we ran. So this makes uh, more than 120 samples. Um, and we combined all these CD8s into a single huge file by taking 3,000 cells per sample. And, uh, and, and we computationally barcoded them. So we knew what file was uh, uh, corresponding to, to, to which barcode. So computationally, we could also go back and have a look at the original data. So by combining all the cells together, then we applied a, a phenograph, which is a computational algorithm capable to cluster cells on the basis of K nearest neighbors. Um, so phenograph uh, basically identifies, cell, identifies cells uh, in clusters with similarities uh, based on similarity and, and on the on the on the cell uh, uh, yeah on on this on the antigen expression. 
um, and identified the number of different clusters that uh, then we were able to analyze uh, uh, by, uh, for example, expressing the different markers or by looking at their frequency in different tissues and by looking uh, um, at, at, at their uh, abundance and distribution. So this is uh, the output. It's one of the outputs that you can obtain. It's just a way to show the data. It's not the only way, but this is a way to show the data. So you've got all the different clusters in a row then uh, identified by the different numbers. And then you've got the markers in the column. Uh, and the heat map gives you an idea of the antigen abundance. Uh, so the darker the color, the more abundant the antigen. And uh, again, as I said, we were able to debarcode the samples. So um, identify the original location of the cells. So in this case, blood, the normal tissue and the tumor, and then do also some statistics. Um, and you can see here that some subsets are more abundant in the blood and you don't find them in the tumor and vice versa. So you can have populations like this one down here, which is uh, 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 pretty rare in the in the in the blood, but you find very much abundant in the tumor. Obviously, you can also do some meta clustering, so the different clusters can be combined close to each other uh, on the basis of their similarities. And the same goes for the different markets. So you have markets that are very much abundant in the tumor, like in this case, or other markets that tend to be uh, uh, like more abundant in in the blood. So what I want to draw your attention on today is uh, this population here, uh, which popped up as cluster seven. So this turned out to be uh, um, an interesting population of cells expressing the checkpoint inhibitor PD-1. Uh, that's important because that's a major target of cancer immunotherapy, including lung cancer. But these cells also express this chemokine receptor CXCR5. Um, and uh, you don't have these cells in the peripheral blood. They're mostly uh, not present. But they're quite abundant or relatively abundant in the, in the, in the tumor. So why that we became interested in this population. Because uh, at the same time when we uh, ran our study, uh, our, our samples, uh, a few papers came out uh, in different journals uh, showing that CXCR5 positive CDA that also expressed PD-1 uh, were uh, considered stem-like populations, a stem-like population of the exhausted T-cell compartment. So these cells had indeed PD-1 expression. They were found in chronically infected mice um, and they express this uh, transcription factor called T cell factor one. At the same time, they had expression of, the, of another transcription factor called EOMS, but they lacked uh, like terminal features of exhaustion, such as expression of the inhibitory receptor TIM3. But the important uh, um, aspect from these papers was also that these cells were actually better responders to NDPD1. It was not the terminally exhausted population responding to NDPD1, but, but was more this uh, subset with pre-exhausted subset or pre-dysfunctional subset, if you want to call it, um, which maintain the capacity to proliferate and, uh, and uh, get activated in response to, to NDPD1. So um, uh, at the time, we didn't have the possibility to do single cell sequencing here, but we took advantage of public data. Uh, this was a single cell sequence, RNA sequencing analysis from metastatic melanoma from this data set. We identified 58 cells expressed in CXCR5, and we basically sorted in silico uh, the cells from, 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 the, from the bulk population by using uh, the markers that we had identified by flow cytometry. So we identified the CXCR5 positive population, the TIM3 positive population. And uh, uh, this was found only in humans. In the mouse, you don't have the double negative population, but we also analyzed that one. Um, and uh, by looking at the level of the different genes, we basically saw that the CXCR5 positive cells here in, in, in purple, they, they overexpress genes related to, to stemness or, or memory development, such as TCS7 or EOMS. Uh, but at the same time, uh, and that, that, that's the interesting aspect that we're going to see in a second in a different study, uh, they also had uh, inhibitory receptor expression, such as PD-1 and TIGIT, but not all of the inhibitory receptors, such as CTLA4 or LAG3. But at the same time, they had also an effector uh, component because they, they simultaneously, they were able to um, uh, uh, retain expression of some cytotoxic markers, such as granzyme A or granzyme K, but not granzyme B, for example. 
So um, I don't want to stress too much this aspect because the paper is published, but uh, the take-home message uh, that also was uh, uh, supported by uh, other studies that came out after hours uh, is that the P1 positive compartment in tumors is actually heterogeneous. You don't have only one single dysfunctional subset, but you have heterogeneity as in many biological processes. And uh, um, there, is, there, is a, there is a hierarchy in this response where stem-like cells or precursor, precursors of exhausted cells now called TPEX uh, ca are capable to self-renew and at the same time to generate more uh, terminally exhausted populations. And uh, the, the important aspect is these ones are, are best responders to NDP1 and not the, the population that was supposed to, to be responding before the identification of these cells. So now there's more papers showing that probably it's not the intratumoral TCF1 positive population actually responding to NDPD1, but after uh, immunotherapy, you have clonal replacements of the cells, maybe come from different sites. And now there's new papers showing that maybe these cells are found in the lymph nodes and the lymph node is the source of, of, of these cells, of the influx of these cells in, in the tumor. So um, this study that I showed you actually uh, raised new questions. So how do the progenitors of exhausted cells that we now call TPEX compare to long-lived memory cells? And also what is the origin and lineage, lineage relationships of these cells uh, uh, if they are dysfunctional in humans? And this is something that uh, Giovanni Gabriele and Emilia addressed uh, in, in my lab very recently uh, with a Nature Immunology paper I published last year. And to do this, we isolated the bulk of memory cells identified by CD95. We sorted them and then uh, performed single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, this was done on cells from peripheral blood cells from four individuals, healthy, so uh, blood bank uh, donors, so in, in the apparent absence of uh, chronic infections or, or cancer. Um, and this is uh, what we obtained. So uh, a large population is identified by expression of KLRB1 and this 161 this identified mate cells, but we were not very interested in that population. Uh, but we were pleased to see the classical differentiation pattern of uh, T cell responses in the peripheral blood by the presence of effector cells uh, with, with the presence of effector genes, terminally differentiated uh, populations, by expression of granzyme B granulizing and other uh, cytotoxic markers. And then a bunch of different uh, early differentiated memory population. You can see that there's three subsets. Actually, one is quite small, but C2 and C6 uh, are, are quite abundant and they tend to share pretty much the same genes. So the question was, why do we identify heterogeneity if, if then we have, uh, uh, if then we have uh, uh, the same genes? So we try to order uh, all these clusters into a, a bimodal plot where we have sets of genes. This is a set of genes correlated to FOXP1 in the x-axis or ZEP2 in the y-axis. And you can see that there is a clear uh, relationship uh, of, of uh, uh, sorry, a clear uh, path of, of differentiation from more quiescent to more terminally differentiated. And you have more or less the same thing if you use as a reference left one or granzyme B. Uh, um, it's a bit more complicated if, if we do other uh, pairwise relationships such as CCR7 versus granzyme K uh, gene sets. Um, but you can see here that C2 and C10 are actually quite similar. Uh, they tend to be different though from C6. So, so C10 is more abundant, was, sorry, C2 was more abundant than C10. So we actually compare C2 to C10. And what you can see here from this pairwise comparison is a C2 uh, overexpresses effector genes such as CCL5 and granzyme K or granulizing. Um, actually, these ones are interesting because they, they can be expressed at the protein level, so we can uh, use markers to detect these populations. Um, instead, the other one tends to express memory genes, such as uh, LEF1 or another metabolic gene called NOSIP. So just to recapitulate this part, we have uh, by single cell sequencing, we can identify early differentiated cells, or, and these can be uh, separated uh, by granzyme K expression. They're both CCR7 positive, but one is K negative and the other one is K positive. 
And then we have the classical effector memory and terminally differentiated cells. So this is mRNA, but we wanted to do protein because the idea was to then identify these cells at the protein level, sort them and characterize. So we designed uh, on the basis of the mRNA data, uh, a single, uh, a, a high dimensional flow cytometry panel, including most of the markers that we found differentially expressed at the mRNA level, plus a number of different markers that uh, we have experience on, and we know they provide heterogeneity to the T cell compartment, including activation markers, uh, inhibitory receptors, such as PD-1 and digit, but also tissue uh, residencies, just 69 and, and 103, especially if we look at peripheral tissues. And this is the results. So this is a new map showing you uh, uh, the populations on the basis of the gates that we apply. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, Remember, this is protein, it's not mRNA. And uh, uh, by looking at CCR7 positive that don't express the granzyme K compared to those that express granzyme K, uh, we don't have an overlap. So they're different. So there is an intrinsic difference um, in, in those subsets. These uh, subsets tend to be differentially abundant in the different tissues. You can find them in the peripheral blood. You can find them in human lymph nodes. Uh, a bit less maybe in the bone marrow, they're almost absent or virtually absent from, from the lung. So this is in line with their less differentiated phenotype identified by CCR7 expression. And this is a, uh, um, uh, this shows you the expression of the different proteins. So one important thing was actually this one, that the, the Gransen K positive population express TIGIT and PD-1. Uh, this is important on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on a couple of aspects. So the first one is uh, that, first of all, we didn't detect any inhibitory receptor expression by mRNA. So uh, single cell sequencing is great because it allows you to detect hundreds of genes at the same time. But sensitivity is not necessarily as good uh, uh, the, same, uh, the same for all the genes. So some genes may not be detected. Instead, we can see protein expression. Uh, the other one is these proteins are expressed on the surface. So we can isolate the cells, viably isolate the cells by using a cell sorter. And that's what we did. So this is just to show you that even though the mRNA was not detected by sequencing, that you can, you can have screaming bright expression um, of, of these receptors by using flow. So you can get digit expression, you can get PD-1 expression, especially this PD-1 uh, P7 reagent was great uh, uh, and, and was uh, very uh, detectable also in the peripheral blood of healthy individuals. So in the peripheral blood of healthy individuals, you have expression of, the, uh, of inhibitory receptors, which I, I, I remind you, they have a physiological function, which is to uh, inhibit immune responses, to terminate immune responses. Uh, if you don't have, especially the, the loss of PD-1 uh, induces immune pathology. Uh, so it controls T-cell responses in physiology. Then it becomes overexpressed in tumors and we exploit that to, as a cancer immunotherapy target, but obviously there is a, a physiological role. So we decided to compare uh, these newly identified populations to what we have identified in the past, especially uh, inside this gate, um, at the double negative gate, uh, those expressing those cells expressed in CD45 RA uh, were coincident with the memory stem cell population that we have described a, a decade ago. So we needed to reconcile uh, the old data with the new data. And the interesting thing was actually this one. So when we sorted central memory cells or stem cell memory cells on the basis of previous gates, but depleted of the PD-1 positive and TIGIT positive population, which is now called TPEX, we couldn't see differences anymore at the transcriptomic level. So actually the difference that we ascribed in the past uh, to, uh, to stem cell membrane central memory cells was actually due to a contamination of a population that we could not identify 10 years ago because of the limit of the technology. And now we could sort these cells and you can see that, the, that there is dozens of differentially expressed genes and especially the TPEX population in line with the expression of, of PD-1 and TIGIT also expresses uh, a number of different molecules related to terminal differentiation or uh, uh, inhibitory function. So you've got ZEP2, uh, ZEP2 is a transcription factor regulating terminal differentiation and TOX, which is a transcription factor 
uh, regulating the development of, of exhaustion or, or dysfunction. Um, these are healthy, healthy individuals. They don't really have uh, an ongoing chronic infection, but still they might have features of uh, uh, dysfunction within their polyclonal uh, T-cell compartment. So uh, this is a flow cytometry course, so I don't want to bother you too much with the biology. Again, this is published, so you can have a look at the paper. Um, I'm sorry, I, I thought I had... Okay, so um, the, the important message here is uh, that the new population PD-1 negative, digit negative, that, that now we identify and, and call STEM, uh, once sorted and stimulated, uh, was actually capable of plastic differentiation. So it was capable to generate all different subsets identified by digit and PD-1 expression. And instead, the double positive population was actually hardwired uh, to its double positive state. So once sorted as double positive, it was capable to virtually generate just double positive cells. We've got some spurious cells here, but I don't think that's, that's very significant. So uh, we have done a lot of different, uh, more different studies uh, on, on chromatin regulation. We saw that the chromatin uh, 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 landscape was actually different from these populations and was also stable. So even though you stimulated, the chromatin landscape didn't tend to converge, so it remained different. And uh, we, came out, we came up with this model, which I think is also supported by uh, data in, in mouse models of infection, where you have a naive population. And depending on the, on, on the acute stimulus or, or chronic stimulus, you go down the functional path or the dysfunctional path. And uh, along these trajectories, you have both stem-like populations and terminal, terminally differentiated populations. So these precursors, in the dysfunctional are those that are responsible to uh, mediate what, what, are, uh, what we think and others think are, are responsible to mediate response to checkpoint blockade. But nevertheless, these cells are hardwired to dysfunction and this is uh, determined at the chromatin level. Um, so once they go down this way, they, they cannot uh, cross uh, the border. Instead, the opposite might be, uh, might be, might be, tr might be possible. This population we showed has some level of resistance to exhaustion. It provides improved functionality upon ACT. And then uh, if then the stimulus becomes chronic, then you, you can cross the board. So um, now we're asking what are the regulators of early ferric decision? Can we revert the dysfunctional light commitment? This is something we're working on these days. So I just want to take the last couple of minutes to uh, show you uh, um, uh, an additional application of all the studies that we do with flow cytometry, the possibility to analyze millions of cells from dozens of patients actually in a quite rapid way. So um, from the first study I showed you, we analyzed CD4, but, sorry, CD8, but we also had CD4 in the panel. So we could uh, actually have access to CD4 phenotypes in non-small cell lung cancer. And this is what Georgia Yolanda and Simone did. Um, this shows you the profile of the C4 cells in the different tissues. You can see very different in, in tumors compared to the blood. Uh, this is the landscape of the antigen expression. But I want to draw your attention on something uh, that we were very much interested in, uh, cells identified by CD25 and FOXP3 expression, so TREX. And these cells were also overexpressing the transcription factor IR4. So what are Tregs? regs T-Rex uh, are a population of cells uh, important in the physiological regulation of, uh, Im of, of immune responses. They inhibit immune responses and they maintain tolerance. Loss of t regs such as in the, in, the, in, in the human disease called IPEX due to mutation of the FOXP3 genes, um, causes severe immune pathology, uh, multiple allergies uh, in, in, in multiple organs. Uh, so it's, it's proof that loss of a specific population of a specific molecular program is involved in, 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 immune, in immune pathology. And these T-Rex can inhibit immune responses by a number of different ways. Uh, that I, uh, I don't want to uh, uh, discuss too much now. From studies from uh, our collaborators and also other groups, we knew that T-Rex and tumors were actually much more suppressive than those found in, in the adjacent lung 
uh, or in the peripheral blood. You can see here as an as a inhibition of uh, uh, T-cell-dependent immune responses. Um, what we did, uh, again, um, uh, we, we in, a, in, a, in a biased way initially, we designed the panel that I showed you, but that panel wasn't capable to identify differences in terms of uh, uh, abundance of different subsets among the different patients uh, according to progression. Because we thought, okay, so we designed the panel because we liked that type of antigen, so we put it in the panel. Uh, so that's a very biased way. So what we decided to do afterwards is to take more unbiased data, such as single cell sequencing, and design the panel by using antigens that are more expressed or are specific for that uh, population of cells. And here uh, you can see some IR4 expression detected by mRNA, but then you can have also protein expression, CC8 and PICOS that we didn't include originally, but we included afterwards in a new panel that we designed and we ran on, a, uh, uh, on several other uh, patients. So here you have different dynamics, uh, CTLs uh, or central memory cells going, uh, disappearing in the tumors, other populations increases, obviously P1 positive memory cells. But at the same time, this, this TREG population, C series positive, IPOS positive, which is uh, 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 just to use surrogate markers to identify IR4 expression. And when we uh, combined all the different phenotypes that I just showed you in the heat map with parameters of disease progression, in this case, we used an indicator of tumor glycolysis, and we see that uh, disease progression is uh, uh, associated with the abundance of these highly activated TREGs that we found in, in the tumors. And at the same time, with multiple exhausted clusters. And the same goes if you subdivide patients according to stage, especially stage one compared to two and three, they tend to be quite different. And we had the same abundance of clusters uh, in, in the, in the uh, faster progressors than the slow progressors. So just to summarize this cartoon, with, uh, with this cartoon, with progression, we tend to have a different landscape of population. So we tend to have early memory, as I showed you before, uh, expressing these markers, or also CTLs, uh, so cells capable to mount a cytotoxic, cytotoxic response. But as the tumor progresses, then you uh, obtain terminally exhausted cells and at the same time a factor T-Rex, highly activated T-Rex with uh, overexpression of, of IR4, which is a master regulator of their function. And uh, more recently, some papers have shown uh, that if you deplete, not block, but you deplete this CCR8 positive T-Rex, you actually have, um, uh, uh, you favor uh, the anti-tumor immune response that you mediate uh, tumor uh, destruction. Um, so with this, um, I'm uh, closing my lecture, uh, and I just want to thank uh, my, my great group. Uh, the, the, they're, the, they're, they're great in, in, in all the studies that I showed you, uh, and also our collaborators in the hospital and, and in, the, in the world, and especially the funding, which is very important. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions.